Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thanks for being on time. We're just going to give this one more minute just to let Zoom, let as many people from that initial registration join us as we can. Um, and we're going to get started in a minute. In the meantime, if you want to chime in in the chat, um, let us know who you are, where you're tuning in from, whose land you're on. Be wonderful. It'd be nice for our um, hosts, our um, panel to get a chance to meet you. So feel free to do that through the chat and we'll get started. Um, so my name is Ari Maharaj. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator at the National Eating Disorder Information Center. I'm pleased to be one of the co-hosts for this webinar uh, alongside JDRF Canada. And my colleague Amanda is going to get a chance to introduce herself in a second. But before we do that, um, I really wanted to do an important acknowledgement, knowing that for NEDIC and for JDRF, we support people all across the land presently colonially called Canada. For NEDIC, our in-person offices are located within Toronto on land described within the Dish With One Spoon, a treaty between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee that bind them to share the territory and protect the land. Indigenous peoples of many nations have lived here for at least the last 15,000 years, and we are all treaty people. We just might not all know about our treaty obligations. Frenetic colleagues who aren't Indigenous to this land, this acknowledgement is a reminder to appreciate and recognize how our relationship with the land, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, is interconnected with how people can experience disordered eating, diabetes, health, and access health care in general. And experiences of racism, of intergenerational trauma, of settler colonialism, of health and equity can have really powerful negative impacts on that health. For us, I think we have to start um, a conversation around the ways in which we support the patients and service users that we support with recognizing their inherent worth as they are, regardless of their relationship to health, and see health as an impermanent state of being. And the degree to which health is even attainable can really vary widely between individuals. We don't believe that being healthy or pursuing health is an obligation an individual is to society nor reflective of someone's value, but we think our job as healthcare providers is to do our best to support them anyway in whatever goals that we have around supporting them and whatever goals they have around supporting them. We have a few resources um, that while Amanda speaks, I'll put some of these resources in the chat. There's some podcasts and blogs to listen to around the ways in which body image and eating, we can think about more Indigenous worldviews in relation to that also a resource that was co-written by Indigenous folks um, to share their experiences more in first person. And so if that's a resource for you or First Nations, Métis, Inuit clients that you have, um, feel free to share. Um, but I'll share a little bit about NEDIC and hand it over to Amanda. We're a Canadian charity that's been helping people affected by eating disorders since 1985. We operate a national toll-free telephone helpline and online chat program in English, which provides support, information, and referrals to people supported or affected by eating disorders and those who care for them. You don't need a diagnosis to contact us. It's a confidential service and anybody can reach out. If it's a concern for you, it's a concern for us. We also do workshops like this, really focused on prevention and early intervention. Um, a lot of our focus is with youth and healthcare providers and post-secondary campuses. Um, but if you feel like you have more questions about NEDIC, you'll see my name pinned in the chat. And if you want to send me direct messages throughout this webinar or email NEDIC at uhn.ca, happy to have a chance to chat with you. Um, but you will see me throughout this in the way that I'll moderate Q&A. But for now, I'll turn over to my colleague, Amanda. Thanks, Ari. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Hailman, and I'm the National Manager of Mental Health Programs with JDRF Canada. And in addition to Ari, I'll be moderating this afternoon as a co-host from JDRF. Uh, so for those of you that aren't familiar with JV JDRF, we are the leading global organization that funds type 1 diabetes research. Um, and the goal of our research is really to improve the lives of all people affected by T1D by accelerating um, progress on the most promising opportunities for curing, better treating, and preventing type 1 diabetes. 
Um, so in late 2021, JDRF Canada launched uh, its mental health strategy in an effort to fund both new research in the area of type 1 diabetes and mental health, but also to help close knowledge gaps among mental health providers and healthcare providers, and really to engage the type 1 diabetes community to increasingly bring mental health into everyday diabetes care, because we know this is a really big gap, especially in the Canadian healthcare system. Um, two of our big initiatives that we have, if you wanted to check them out, um, in collaboration with Diabetes Canada is our mental health and diabetes training program. That's available at learn.jdrf.ca. And then we also have the Mental Health and Diabetes Directory, which is a directory of mental health providers that have actually gone through the training that are accepting new patients um, that have a baseline understanding of the impacts of mental health on type 1 diabetes and that's available at directory.jdrf.ca. Um, if you wanted to learn more about T1D and mental health, we have a section on our website under information for healthcare providers, um, including one document that's specifically related to um, recognizing disordered eating in people with T1D, which will be touched on a little bit in this presentation as well. Um, so the chat is open for you to ask questions. Thanks so much for um, introducing yourselves. I've been seeing them come in. And uh, if you do have any sort of tech questions, uh, Ari is available, like you mentioned, to answer any questions. Um, and if you have any comments, general questions for our panelists, please do populate them into the chat. Um, if it does become super active, we might pause it just so we can catch up and make sure that uh, we're not sort of overwhelmed. Um, but you will also have the opportunity to sort of use the raise hand icon and verbally ask your question to our panelists and we'll call on you. Um, please don't unmute yourself unless you're called upon. Um, and the panel discussion will be recorded and it will be available both on the JDRF YouTube channel and Netix as well. The format of this webinar is going to be a case study presentation. So we'll have two case studies, each about 20 minutes that our panelists will walk through and, and explain and then um, they'll kind of speak to uh, each case from their different perspective. Uh, and we'll have a Q&A, an opportunity to ask questions about the case and engage with the case um, with our presenters and the folks that are attending here today. Um, and then at the end, we'll also have some time for QA if there's something that we didn't get to. And if we do have a lot of questions, we are keeping track of them and we'll do our best to kind of send a follow-up um, of any unanswered questions that we can kind of answer post-webinar. Um, just a reminder to everyone, please do whatever you need to take care of yourself during this event. We know that there might be some surprising or difficult emotions that come up. Um, like I already mentioned, he's available for a chat if you needed to send him a message. Uh, if you do live with type 1 diabetes yourself, make sure you have a snack or a juice handy um, available for, for the next uh, 90 minutes or so. Um, just one note on language. So the panelists and the moderators, myself and Ari, um, we're speaking from an I perspective. So this is really just not to make any assumptions about others' experiences. Uh, and the facilitators here and the moderators and panelists only represent their own perspective. And we recognize that uh, as, as much as we try to have a sort of comprehensive multidisciplinary approach, not all perspectives are captured here. And just to give a introduction to who's actually going to be speaking here today, uh, so we have Sylvana Sita, who is an, an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Neurosciences at the Faculty of Medicine of Laval University and a researcher as well there. We have uh, Anne-Sophie Brazo, who's an assistant professor and the director of the Dietetics Education and Practice Program at McGill University School of Human Nutrition. We have Remy Ravasalaret, who is an endocrinologist at the Montreal Clinical Research Institute, or IRCM, and the University of Montreal Hospital Center, SHUM. He serves as the director of the Diabetes Clinic and the Metabolic Research Unit at IRCM, and he's a full professor at the University of Montreal. And we also have Ode Bandini, who's been living with type 1 diabetes since 1992, who has lived experience of type 1 diabetes as well as eating disorders. And she is a philosophy professor at the University of Montreal, a volunteer with JDRF Canada, as well as a patient part partner in the Better Project. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to our panelists. Um, thank you very much for all this presentation. And um, 
for I would say having served the table. So we are very pleased to be here today. And this is like the step two of our first webinar we did a few months ago uh, now, which was more about introducing the concept and the interrelation between eating disorder and um the type one diabetes. So today it's more the idea to go more uh, deeper in the concept and this is uh, going to be through two clinical cases. Um, so <laughs> that's for first, that's our conflict of interest. Um, and our objectives um, are to recognize potential indicators of eating disorder, particularly across what we call unusual symptom presentation. And uh, you will see that both clinical cases are quite unusual uh, presentation. And we also try to illustrate the significance of adjusting clinical intervention in accordance with endocrine and eating behaviors. And also, we will try to underscore the importance of uh, those transitional phases, especially from uh, the young to adult and patient stigmatization. Uh, so first of all, a quick reminder, Anne Sophie. Sure. So since uh, today we have people that are more from the mental health uh, sphere and some people are from the diabetes uh, sphere, we wanted to just do a little overview of, of key concept about uh, type 1 diabetes and um, eating disorder. So type 1 diabetes, just to remind, just a, a little reminder that the autoimmune form of diabetes, so that means that there is destruction, destruction, destruction of the cell that produce uh, insulin, and so there's requirement for insulin admission daily, multiple time a day. Um, it can be diagnosed at all ages, but about half of the cases, or a bit more, are diagnosed during childhood. Um, people will requ be required to do blood glucose monitoring, so to look after their blood glucose levels. As mentioned, insulin adjustment according to what they eat, the exercise, the stress. So there's a lot of factors that comes into uh, the daily management of diabetes. It's 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week, 37, 365 days a year. So it's constant. Um, and we want to make sure that we manage blood glucose levels uh, to to avoid as much as we can acute complications such as uh, hypoglycemia or diabetic ketoacidosis or also to avoid any or to to postpone or delay the, the onset of chronic complication that can be high complication, kidney complication, nerves complication. And so all of that to say that type 1 diabetes requires a lot of self-management from the person that is living with, uh, and it will impact uh, the way they, they feel some, uh, they, they feel some of their, um, they, they may have different feelings, feelings for uh, when they are uh, hungry, feelings when they have hypoglycemia. And so we will discuss that today, but we need to understand type 1 diabetes to better understand eating disorder that are related to, to type 1 diabetes. Anything I, to add? <laughs> no, I, I will say at Contrario, we have to better understand eating disorder, disordered eating to uh, better care uh, with individuals uh, living with type 1 diabetes. So uh, just a quick overlook to the eating disorders continuum. Um, you know, a, a core symptom traditionally described for eating disorder or, uh, is body image issue, uh, meaning that your body image will excessively influence your self-image, self-esteem. And based on this uh, symptom, um, we have, I will say, two sides of the spectrum. The first one, which is more about eating restriction, food restriction, and the more illustrative disorder is anorexia nervosa, which will lead to uh, restraint from eating in order to decrease the calorie intake and to lose weight and more and more weight. And on the same aspect of the spectrum, we also have uh, orthorexia, which is more about eating under the pressure of low, uh, rigid, low rules uh, on what to eat and when to eat. And um, a more disinhibited 
uh, eating disorder is bulimia. Bulimia is the recurrences of binge eating episode, which will uh, be followed by compensation compensatory behavior, such as vomiting uh, or uh, taking laxative or diuretic. At the other hand of the spectrum, we will have more uh, dismissed eating disorder, which is, uh, for one of the best examples, the binge eating disorder, which uh, will be the recurrences of binge eating episode without any compensatory behavior. Um, but uh, in this part of the spectrum, we will also have some compulsive eating, meaning eating repeatedly or during the day, all day long, or uh, grazing. Um, and what we have to understand is that beyond the traditional, most more described eating disorder that are anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder, we have a full range of uh, behavior that can lead or conduct to suffering suffering uh, in people, in individuals. So that's what we call the disordered eating. That's um, more like, I was, uh, what I just say, between the normal and the eating classical disorder. And um, this can include uh, suffering or behavioral such as like frequent dieting or just like anxiety, anxiety associated with specific food or meal, uh, skipping, fasting or purging to make up for bad food, also chronic weight fluctuation, rigid ritual uh, surrounding food and exercise, like in uh, orthorexia, but also intense feeling of guilt and shame associated with eating. Um, another uh, very frequent uh, eating, disordered eating, especially in type 1 diabetes, will be the feeling of loss of control over food, uh, which may lead to compulsive eating. And also, what um, is Interesting is that currently in the actual literature, the warning sign of eating disorder are um, also described regarding or being specific of type 1 diabetes. And what we consider as non specific are uh, sports school or work performance, especially uh, acute decrease in performance, trouble with interpersonal relationships, depressive symptoms, frequent dieting, laxative or diuretic use, self induced. Uh, vomit, vomiting and excessive exercise. Traditionally, we also used to um, describe amenorrhea, uh, amenorrhea as part of uh, eating disorder and anorexia nervosa definition. But nowadays, we are uh, this symptom is no more in the classification, but still relevant. So this is more like overall general symptom, but uh, some are described as more specific of type one uh, of eating disorder in individual with type one diabetes, and, um, and and I mean that's a classical definition, and we can have a discussion uh, around this because we are not so sure <laughs> that are the best uh, indicators, but that's the the one which are the more described, and uh, that's a poor adherence to blood glucose monitoring or insulin administration. The recurrent exercise related hypoglycemia, the unexplained increase in uh, glycated hemoglobin level, especially um, when it's uh, quite of a very uh, fast change. Uh, also, persistent hyperglycemia in the morning and also um, repeated episode of diabetic ketoacidosis as a consequence of insulin privation. So, this is what we are traditionally describing uh, about a warning sign of eating disorder. But um, what we'll try to show you across our two different clinical case, cases is that sometimes the reality is very different. And um, for the first case, uh, I would like to tell you about one of my patients, he was uh, addressed to me in consultation for uh, an eating disorder, referred in an eating disorder center. And this young man um, had in his um, personal psychiatric history one um, diagnosis of ADHD uh, and no other um, psychiatric history. Regarding the medical condition, uh, his type 1 diabetes was diagnosed at the age of 13. Um, he had quite high number of hypoglycemia uh, a few years ago, but seems be more stable, uh, if you want to say like that, uh, since a few years. Um, but recently, he did a, a severe episode 
of diabetic ketoacidosis with an um, lead him to the emergency unit. Regarding his habits, he do not consume any alcohol, and which is very uh, interesting is that he told me that he avoided to consume any alcohol because he was too anxious to deal with uh, alcohol calorie and uh, insulin uh, compensation. He did not take any coffee, tea, or energy drinks. He used uh, to take some more recreative drugs like uh, cocaine or amphetamine, but not uh, since uh, a few years now. So regarding the type 1 diabetes history, um, he told me that it was quite a complicated diagnosis. The time was very difficult for him. The diabetes was very unstable at the first time. Um, and uh, he can explain me, he could explain me that his mother supported him a lot uh, and was kind of very supportive, meaning taking care of a big part of the diabetes. Uh, of diabetic care. And um, currently is using uh, a CGM, a continuous glucose monitoring, and an insulin pump. He is very uh, comfortable with the use of the equipment. No anxiety regarding uh, this, but uh, regarding the bolus injection, he cannot do any injection in the bolus. And um, when it comes to correct hypoglycemia, the fear uh, comes and he reach, um, I would say, a very high number of uh, glucose, carbohydrate, uh, in for the compensation, up to 100 grams um, from juice. And do not take any protein or can I deal with all the rules, injunctions, will I say, that the dietitian uh, gave to him. And this is an extract of uh, his CGM. And we can see that the estimate uh, glycated hemoglobin is around 10% and is more than 90% time above uh, his target. So he's really trying to avoid any hypoglycemia. Um, regarding nutritional aspect, um, what I found is it was very disorganized, um, no specific hours to heat. And what appeared to, appeared to me is that, you know, all was about anxieties. Uh, everything was worrying him. He cannot take any glucid or carbohydrate from his diet because, from his diet because he was afraid of having to inject insulin or to compensate uh, the blood increase. Um, he explained also uh, that he lost, he has lost all sense of appetite. And um, which is also interesting is that, and, and remember I told you that in classical definition of eating disorder, body shape is a core symptom. Uh, I mean, he would like to gain weight uh, because he lost a few pounds uh, during the recent ketoacidosic epi uh, episode, but he cannot do that. He feel very, uh, it's very difficult for him to gain weight. Uh, and he do not describe any loss of control over eating. I mean, it's more about restriction, but uh, he also um, experiments and he, uh, many cravings, uh, but uh, it's, um, it's still relevant, but less frequent than it used to be. And this craving especially appear after smoking cessation a few years ago. And um, regarding mental assessment, you know, uh, he arrived, I think, like more than a half an hour earlier of his appointment. It was kind of very stressful. He easily discussed uh, his emotional experiences and the connection he made internally. I mean, he was quite, quite smart guy, trying to understand what he was living and going through. His speech was completely coherent and appropriate, but, you know, most of the speech was around the fear of hypoglycemia. Affects were hygienic, anxious, not blunted, quite normal uh, effects. He described having had panic attacks uh, a few times before, and he, have, he had and still have this strong fear that this panic attack comes back again. Um, and which worried me a little I will say more as a psychiatrist that uh, recently he started to uh, develop some obsessive and compulsive elements. I mean, he uh, 
to he avoid to change the color of his um, sweater due to the fear uh, that will disrupt his uh, diabetes. And he knows that was completely uh, crazy and that was used <laughs> as a term, but you know, cannot avoid uh, this feeling or, or thought. And this is really a symptom of uh, compulsive uh, disorder. And other other aspects, sleep, etc. Everything was good. It was very about really about anxiety. Um, Before we go to the panel, yeah. um, Ari put in the chat that you had to Google uh, Google what is itemic means. Ah, yeah, um, surely. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> so maybe you want to explain. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry, that's that's kind of, you know, a psychiatric world. We love speaking another language, you know, nobody can understand us. Uh, I mean, achieving means that the mood is correct, is normal. It's not sad, not uh, joy, having a normal mood uh, with the ability to uh, experiment different affect, different state of mood. So this, this means everything was good regarding the mood aspect. Is that correct? Um, so, I mean, this uh, Mr. Mrs. Mr. Health was addressed to me for an eating disorder. I mean, but uh, as you may have already perceived, he was not really about a classical usual eating disorder. I mean, it's not an anorexia nervosa, obviously. Uh, it's not a bulimia nervosa, but we can also perceive that there is a high degree of uh, suffering from uh, eating. So uh, I will ask to uh, my colleague, what do they think can happen uh, for Mr. Hills? And if you have any suggestion in the chat or feel free. Um, so maybe in the chat they can, they can put what seems to be very striking to them or yeah. surprising about this case um and and we can definitely discuss it uh, let, for us. let me start silva and try to play the all grumpy doctor focused exclusively on, on glucose as you say as you know i am like this so is it an eating disorder or is it only a non-compliant patient uh, with which have some kind of eating behaviors with no relationship, no direct relationship, actually. Uh, maybe we could say you just have to take his insulin, right dose, and everything is going to be okay. And I'm voluntarily provocative for the ones who don't know me. <laughs> I mean, what's a non-compliant patient, is what you say? That yes, non-compliant patient, yes. Uh, Non-adherent patient. Uh, he just needs to take his treatment at the right dose. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the first answer for me is he rise up to my consultation. I mean, he wait to see me. He came on time, be first time. So, I mean, as a compliant patient, he's trying to get help. So you can just answer that. I, I love, I love your, I love your answer. So, but, but my, my point to, to the people listening is that in a lot of teams, he mm. would be labeled as a patient that is uh, not taking his treatment in the right way. And that would be the only treat the only main conclusion of the medical note. So I like the fact that the Undo team here thought there was something else behind. But really, Remy, you address um, what is a main concern for me and I think for all of us here. Uh, it's the same thing for eating disorder. You know, how many times I heard that, you know, patients suffering uh, from anorexia and nervosa don't want to be cured, don't want to be treated, are non compliant to treatment, etc. But truly, you know, we do not have a very efficient care in anorexia and nervosa. We can say that. Whenever, I mean, by efficient, I mean right one pills solution. And, you know, patient came to our consultation, try to involve, and what we have uh, to do is to go behind first appearances and to find the way to address um, the difficulties, the resistance, if we call them like that, in order to care uh, of our patients. So it's the same thing for diabetes. I mean, no, it's quite easy to say, okay, just take protein in your collation and you will deal with your fear of hypoglycemia. 
it will help you not to have a secondary decrease. But three is not the case here. And we can see for uh, Mr. S, it's more about anxiety and fear. Yeah, there's actually a lot of questions in the chat, the comments about addressing fear of hypoglycemia as a, a first step. And we have someone uh, who uh, rose her hand, I think Sylvia. Yes, Sylvia, please go ahead. Yes, what also stood out for me and that um, really works into what the the provocative doctor just said is a statement of he can't he can't gain weight you know that really builds into oh just take his medication and the biology will work itself out when in fact you know, I especially specialize in eating disorder. I'm a dietitian and also a, a, a therapist. And so, my when I hear that statement, I hear the medical the medical emphasis as a solution. But I also put my my mental health hat on and say, is what do you mean by he can't? If we look at it from a mental health perspective, then we get a. a um, a deeper sense of the can't. Is this a mental health barrier can't, or is it only a um, a physiological issue? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I don't have. Uh, I would case... think it's both, Sylvie. Yeah. In this case, uh, because. Like the 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 fact that this person is in hyperglycemia most of the time, clearly losing glucose in his urine, like it's it's a difficulty to gain weight in when you are in a catabolic state like that. So of sure. course, but you've been talking about the fact that he he fear of eating certain quantity of foods, certain carbs. So I think we are really playing on both sides in this case. Yeah. For sure. and in the same time, you know, he doesn't, he didn't, it doesn't feel any uh, hunger feeling. Uh, so, you know, it's difficult to uh, estimate all you have to eat when you do not have any sensation to uh, help you, to guide you. And also there is kind of, uh, and, and maybe uh, Remy uh, will help me to answer this question, but there is also quite an ambiguity, you know, this patient have a lower weight uh, and try to gain weight, but at the contrary, how many times we can hear that gaining weight in uh, diabetes is also uh, gaining insulin resistance and uh, meaning also um, taking the risk to uh, needing to need more and more insulin. So it can also be normally frightening process <laughs> or, or, or aspect, even if it's not an eating disorder. It's not a body concern. It's also a health concern. So. Um, uh, I, I fully agree. We should yeah. not stigmatize uh, overweight and obesity, but at the same time, we need to acknowledge that it can aggravate some other health problems or add problems to type 1 diabetes. And as you alluded to, we need to acknowledge that type 1 diabetes is bringing so much nutritional issues like uh, carbohydrate counting, which is mainstream and probably for some good reasons, but in, con in con the context of eating disorder, it can be a, a huge problem. Uh, you need to think to your insulin dose every time you eat. There is hypoglycemia uh, with all what it impact it can bring as fear for that patient, but also the need to eat frequently to take uh, snacks multiple times, even when you're not hungry, or on the opposite, uh, hypoglycemia can uh, trigger some huge hunger uh, aspects in patient. A patient frequently tell me that uh, she would kill to get uh, food uh, when she's in hypoglycemia. Uh, so, um, and yes, there is a trend of weight gain that we obviously see, for example, in our registry. We, we clearly see that around 40% of people living with type 1 and are overweight and 20% facing obesity. And again, we, we no stigmatization, but it can aggravate problems like hypertension and and, and, and some other issues. So it's, it's a double-edged sword, which is not always very easy to, to manage because 
you don't want to put this up front, but at the same time, it can complexify some of the management of type 1 diabetes. And I'm speaking here for the patient every day. I think that patients speak off very frequently. Higher insulin dose with over with gaining weight. And, and there is a big thinking in a lot of patients that more insulin is not good. That's meaning that their health is not good because the less there is kind of feeling that the more you need, the more you're sick. It, it's not fully true, but we need to acknowledge that this is the case for a lot of patient, persons living with type 1. <laughs> Yeah, if, if I may, what struck me in that case description is the... I would have to or yeah. If oh, some I, people I, that yeah. could mute <laughs> their, their mic, it would be really appreciated. Please, thank you. Um, it, it's the coexistence between two uh, character traits, which are um, a need of control, that is expressed in the somehow rational control that changing his sweater color could affect uh, his uh, uh, blood glucose levels, and as well uh, willing to avoid alcohol at all costs in case it may uh, affect uh, his uh, glycemia as well. And on the other hand, uh, some thing that is suggestive of a lot of a, a lot a lot of control when he um, correct a hypo with one hundred grams of uh, sugary drinks or whatever, and I think that uh, I'd love to have your opinion about that. Uh, but my feeling is that uh, a lot of things in type one diabetes are about control because you have to control uh, nearly everything. And sometimes, uh, and I'm just speaking from my own experience here, is that you invest so much energy in control that when something goes wrong and you fail, you feel like a total failure. And since since it's going bananas, let's, you know, <laughs> and I'll go and I'll get back to it tomorrow or, or not. But perhaps there is a, a question of balance between the amount of control that you are feeling obligated to stick with and sometimes the need for relief and, you know, not to worry that much and so forth. And I guess that one may lead to the other which is too much control for a certain range of time might get you to the wall and, and you and you will definitely crash. Yeah. I think you put words on the difficulties of living with diabetes. Yeah, I heard about living with type 1 diabetes mm -hmm. of 40 last year. I think everyone should hear a bit more so we can understand, like, we will be better at understanding our patient um, if, if we had experienced that just once. The fact that it's constant, it's all the time, and sometimes you need a break, but you don't have any break. Um, and it will interfere with mental health. It will interfere with diabetes management, it will interfere everywhere. Well, I, I guess for any um, both physical and mental health provider, mm -hmm. there are uh, experience, personal experiences on which you can build, which is, I don't know, uh, try to stick with a given routine, go to the gym or um, take care of a minor issue and you have to take a treatment even though you don't feel ill or whatever. It's very hard. You have to think about it. You have to actually do it, even when you don't feel like doing it. Uh, so I, I don't think that it is so strange or alien to all of us. Just keep in mind for you healthcare providers, please keep in mind that we are human. Um, I'm, it, I'm seeing it, something in the... Chat. Oh, go ahead on Sophie and then I'll ask a question I'm getting from the chat. Uh, I was going to, uh, to say that like a lot of people in the chat have said like we should address uh, the fear of hypoglycemia. 
Um, and I think it's interesting that this patient was referred by the diabetes team uh, to the psychiatrist for an eating disorder. And now we are discussing back to the fact that fear of hypoglycemia might be a key element. And so that's also speaks about the importance of having a very a, a global view on what the patient is experiencing. And so I was going to ask Sylvie what he thinks about like addressing the sphere of hypoglycemia as something like first line. Yeah, that's very interesting because uh, I think one of the trait in this clinical case uh, uh, is uh, to fully understand the situation. I mean, Mr. Ayers was kind of children that grow up very fast and you, you spoke about control old and he was kind of giving a part of the control to his mother and as an adult he did not have access anymore to this reassurance uh, way to his mother as a, a contraphobic uh, will i say <laughs> tools and i was just i mean face to himself and um speaking of this hypoglycemia, I mean, uh, and one question in the chat was about uh, going to explore when the fear starts. And that's very important because in this case, the fear of hypoglycemia starts in the same period he had to face a panic attack. I mean, both were at the same time for different reasons. And uh, he kind of memorized both together. So as soon as blood glucose variation appear, the fear of, of an panic attack recidivism appear. And as soon as anxiety raise, I grow up, his fear of having an hypoglycemia increased too. I mean, and um, I, I don't know by which time we should start the care, but you have to address both. And in my case, as a psychiatrist, I mean, I start by anxiety, overall anxiety, because you also have more generalized anxiety and this um, OCD symptom, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder symptoms that appear. So, uh, I mean, I was more comfortable to start by uh, treating anxiety, uh, but indeed going in a deep comprehension, in a true discussion with the patient is the best way to find, um, I mean, say the best treatment option, will I say. And uh, you have to really have this discussion with this patient. Uh, uh, you cannot choose for them. Yeah, I like Sylvain noting that even the focus on anxiety, we have um, someone in the chat, Caroline, noting as diabetes educators, I think we're sometimes so trained to focus on hypoglycemia related issues that we might be tempted to focus on that fear to the exclusion of other potential issues like control, like Ode mentioned, or the food restriction, like the avoiding carbs to reduce insulin needs and therefore maybe inject some injection frequency. Um, so yeah, I... I appreciate the linked conversation that we're having here and, and the comments in the chat. There are two um, folks who raised their hand. Um, so Sylvia, I'm gonna go to you and then Natalie, I'll put you on spotlight and then we'll have some final comments about this case before going on to case two. So yeah. Sylvia, let me go ahead. I was just, um, I I want to 100% um, agree with Sylvain, and I think it was Audi, because we are not just looking at um, a symptom or a disease. We're looking at a whole person. Um, and so by the time that the person comes to you, and I think this person was, was showing symptoms, they were um, a while before they actually got diagnosed. That person then, and even, you know, months and years later, they're dealing with a whole myriad of life. And I think the idea of um, looking at really analyzing control is not only about the the um, diabetes itself, but it's life in general. So I really, really like that larger, you know, looking at that person has a holistic person who comes with all the challenges of life in addition to, or as a result of, or emphasized by, the um the diabetes and the the need for tight control or else 
sort of a thing. So that's that's really, I, I mean, again, remember, I'm, a, I'm also a, a dietitian, so I'm not ignoring the, the um, physical health piece, but so often that mental health piece gets lost. And I'm going to keep coming back to that. And I'm sure Sylvain will help me with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks. Panel, anything you want to say in response to that before we go to Natalie? I, I think we can also highlight in this case the age of our young men, 24. So mm -hmm. it's also a young man that just transitioned from pediatric care to adult care. He had his severe hypos when he was 18, 19. And so there's a life trajectory here that I think we need to take into account in this in this case as well. Um, and we didn't emphasize that too much in our discussion, but I think it's also important when we are trying to understand this young man. That's just what I wanted to add. Thanks, Anne-Sophie. Go ahead, Natalie. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just thinking that, um, I think, is it old? Ode? Am I pronouncing it? Ode? You mentioned around that kind of dialectic of the need for control, but need for surrendering. I'm also a type one, so I, I get that. But I something that was coming to mind um, about supporting a young man like this is what what seemed really cool to me is he he really does have that that sense of needing to control yet at the same time he has this ability to rely on an insulin pump and a cgm which we may not see in some people who are really really fixated on that control um i've noticed that there's some folks who who may not even trust it and they think well i know better right so that might almost be an entry point to control to explore with with him is you know, there is this need for control and there's this ability that you have to be able to kind of trust your medical team and their suggestions or, or trust the technology. Um, so that might be one thing I might lean into um, as well to really just kind of bolster up the strengths that he does have and, and ways that part of him being able to control things is also surrendering and, and allowing the um, what the recommendations have been for his treatment as well. Sylvain, may I ask, in, in the interest of the audience, is the fact that he is a male typical or atypical? Can you comment a bit on, on, on this? There is a higher prevalence of eating disorders. We admit that he has some eating disorder in, in women, usually. I mean, I'm not convinced <laughs> he had an eating disorder. Uh, maybe a disorder of eating, uh, and and not um, classically usually the, the sex ratio uh, is higher in women than men uh, for I mean almost all eating disorder with uh, a higher uh, sex ratio prevalence for women in anorexia nervosa and this uh, quite smaller sex ratio difference for binge eating disorder, but uh, eating disorder are more frequent uh, in women and i will say also they are more frequently diagnosed in women and we have to keep in mind that even if more frequent in women not only uh, women can suffer from eating disorder I mean, uh, and maybe to conclude because i, I know time is going <laughs> uh, and regarding the the psychiatry diagnostic. Um, it, it was more about, uh, for, regarding my diagnosis, I mean, uh, more about a, a specific FOB, a fear of hypoglycemia. Uh, I will say non specified anxiety disorder around the uh, beginning of obsessive compulsive disorder, which was more uh, wondering me, and also uh, ADHD. And what I did, uh, the first thing was to allow him to breathe a little, giving back the um, you know, this application uh, but, uh, with a D <laughs> that can uh, allow you to um, permit to um, a close one to follow uh, your uh, glycemia. So he did so with his mother and we named that was not the best solution, but it was a good way to breathe a little. And uh, so we did that. Also, a lot of psychoeducation about panic attack. You know, you don't die in a panic attack. You survive and uh, trying to also explain all the symptoms of hypoglycemia can be the same 
than uh, the anxiety and you have to learn how to make the difference if possible because it's not always possible also to say that and um also, uh, um, what I did was just to introduce some sertraline, uh, which is an antidepressant uh, that can really help for anxiety and uh, OCD. And honestly, it was really efficient and uh, very helpful for him because he can regain uh, say control, even if I hate the control term, but uh, regain some control in his overall life by decreasing uh, the middle level of anxiety and uh, being able to deal again uh, with this uh, fear and uh, helping to uh, be more in his with his uh, diabetes, if you can say that. So that was my intervention uh, for this patient. So, you I mean, it's not really about, for me, eating disorder as classical definition of eating disorder, but real preoccupation and suffering from uh, eating, we have to take care of. So we can go to the next case, Remy. Yes. Okay. So let's uh, discuss another uh, unusual uh, situation. If you can, uh, am I allowed to move the uh, slide? I think, yes, you are. I am. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I missed. Can you try? Let me check this. No, it doesn't seem I am able to okay. move the slides. I if will you do can, the job. Please, uh, Sylvain, thank you. Um, so uh, it's the case of a woman who was referred to me not very long ago, a few months. Um, she's in the end of her 40s, uh, and she's transferred by a colleague. And from the beginning, it's a bit difficult because I know that colleague follow a lot of patients with type 1, and usually I don't have referral for type patients living with type 1 from that colleague. So, but you know, it's request for transfer and uh, we take it. So she have been living for, for diabetes for, for a long, not a few decades. Uh, she have a very small retinopathy and a very small microalbuminuria. It's better to have none of these, but it's not major complication. All of this, we know now that we can control them. She have epilepsy uh, now uh, for more than three decades. And, you know, this can be intricated with type 1 diabetes, specifically when there has been history of repeated severe hypoglycemia. But this was not the case here. Um, no alcohol, no tobacco. She is very exuberant from the first uh, meeting. And she tell me that she walks every day 10,000 steps a day. And then she monitored this on the top of monitoring her glucose levels. Next slide, please, Sylvain. Um, Never had any severe hypoglycemia or ketoacidosis. She used a CGM with alarm. And for our colleagues coming from the eating disorder, now in the type 1 diabetes world, at least in the one that are, have access to a, a few information, it's around two-thirds of people that uh, use a continuous glucose monitoring, which can, at the beginning, trigger some eating disorders or at least concern about food when you can see the... The, the wings, uh, the, the fluctuation of glucose, but usually a lot of patients after a few days believe that there is far more advantages than disadvantages around having a continuous glucose monitoring. It's a little device who measure glucose under the skin. You probably maybe have seen frequently worn on the arm, but not always. Um, she's using multiple injections. So that's usually means for injection at days. Uh, when you have a patient for the first time, whether it's a transfer from the pediatric world or a transfer from another clique, it's always good to have a few questions about uh, basic knowledge, not to judge the patient, but just to assess, not to estimate that he, she, because she is living for decades with diabetes, knows everything about diabetes. At the same time, we absolutely need to acknowledge that the patient knowledge is sometimes far higher than ours. So there is kind of a yin and yang here uh, to manage in, in a first uh, appointment. Um, she is really very exuberant. Uh, she speaks a lot. And she live a little stone that I neglected at the beginning, but I, I took it in my notes. She said, you know, by the way, uh, I recently had to redo all my teeth. Uh, because of type 1 diabetes, she actually mentioned that she had to take uh, she, she she had to take money from the bank for that and that she's now having a very significant death. And she's telling me that she's happy about the transfer, but still not very clear for me uh, why she was transferred. 
Her most recent labs are exactly what you would await based on her medical history. Her blood pressure is correct. Her BMI is there. She still mentioned that she had a lot of judgments about her weight uh, 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 during her history, starting from the pediatric, that she should not gain weight with years, that that's bad. Uh, next slide, please. And here is her glucose profile. We are at the opposite of the case uh, presented by Sylvain. Everything is absolutely perfect. No hypoglycemia, 87% time in range. For those who are not aware of this, we are aiming for above 70% and 1% of the time is 15 minutes from a day. So this is a, a what, oh my God, uh, I'm the happy endo. I just got a very easy patient to follow. A one C is good. She is happy to be with me. Everything is good. So I, I congratulate her about everything, and we manage for the next appointment. And she leave my office relatively happy. I'm a strange doctor. I'm giving my email to patients. I'm following some from very remote location, and the next morning I have three emails. So I said, "Oh my God, I'm going to have." to do teaching about how and when to use email with me. But in all those emails, she's asked, asking for semaglutide, also known as azempic, uh, to help her to manage her diabetes. And, and there is a big, specifically in the social media, uh, there is a lot of things around azempic. There is also maybe a space for azempic for some people living with type one, though most of insurance, public or private, would not acknowledge for this. So rather than to start what I call the ping pong email, I propose a rapid new appointment, far better a few weeks rather than a few months after uh, I met her. And there, she's not the same person. I saw her three weeks ago and she was exuberant and happy. Uh, and there she seems to be extremely uncomfortable. And so I come back in a little stone that I completely neglected at the first thing because I wrote my, I read back my notes. I said, what about speaking about the thieves? And she said, you know, actually, I am a master of controlling my glucose with uh, bulimia and vomiting. Actually, I lost all my teeth because I am vomiting three or four times a year. And I know exactly when to vomit and how much insulin to do based on what I'm going to vomit to keep a perfectly normal blood sugar. So she has been eating, she then vomit. Uh, there's obvious anxiety there. So it's kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the, the, the thing completely uh, changed. And, and then I, I, I sh the question that I didn't have exactly the good answer at the beginning, because I also asked, say, well, cool, why have you changed? She said that she tried to discuss this issue multiple times with her team, but that she was always considered as the perfect patients because the blood pressure, the glucose control, the lipids, and so on, were all in good order. So that is the main focus of diabetes treatment. It should be not only the only focus. So uh, we are having a perfectly normal or optimal blood glucose control in the context of bulimia and vomiting in, in that patient, which was, I, I completely neglected at, at the beginning. I mean, she, she didn't disclose it neither, but you can, you probably understand that getting to a new team, it's not very easy to come and raise the flag and say, oh, by the way, I have a major eating disorder and I'm not the good patient. So uh, that you you seems to to see in front of you and, and don't take me by the word, there is no good and bad patients uh, and so on. So it was a completely different patient after a few uh, weeks and because of that email and actually she told me that because she came back home and started to have a big bulimia, a raptus and then vomiting, she decided that she would need to, to write me. But actually in the email, there was nothing about eating disorder. There was something about a Zempic that might be able to help her. Okay, Silva. so let's maybe discuss about uh, this, uh, unu another unusual case. And maybe we can do the same as before if anyone in the chat want to put whatever they find striking about this case, uh, feel free to uh, to comment. Um, for me, uh, I think what's what was interesting is that we often, in the diabetes world, we often focus on glucose management. Um, and this is a, 
eye-opening case where we need to go beyond those glucose numbers. Um, and I think, Remy, the way you invited her to reach out to you, you kind of give her uh, room for her to express herself. Um, and you 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 went beyond the, the number, not necessarily during the medical appointment, but you gave her room to go there with you. And I think this is, um, it's a really interesting case. Yes, it's kind of below the surface, you know, the surface, everything was going fine. It's a bit like the little duck analogy <laughs> beyond there. There is a, a lot of, I, I must say that I remember some of her words, uh, words, sorry, uh, you know, most of you, you have uh, four different French accents. It's probably hard for the Anglophone here tonight, but uh, so uh, words and not world. Uh, she, she was speaking about feeling guilty and, and also about uh, the pain she had. Uh, she was suffering from that problem. So uh, she was really looking relieved that at least she was able to address it in a context of a new team. And I believe sometimes it's good that a patient change team. It's not always easy, but sometimes that's it's it's it allow a new start. And this is, you know, especially and very important because um, to create a secure space is sometimes difficult for us. And I mean, even if everything is perfect, you can just say, okay, do not speak of anything else. You know, that's sometimes the message we can involuntarily send to the patient. And I mean you reach to create a secure enough space in order to send you email on the next day and to allow her just to say, okay, everything is not perfect. And I think this is very important for us as a physician or a dietitian or any health practitioner, you know, just let a space for the patient to say, okay, uh, have you anything difficult to face that we did not address? Have you any things that bore you <laughs> during your day long or anything you want to speak we didn't address today and i always finish my consultation by this i um, mean something you think we have go through all the things uh, you are that are important for you and uh, you can take five minutes more to speak of that or replane a new appointment and this is very important and actually, it's, you're speaking about the end of the consultation, but I believe it also started at the beginning of the consultation when you ask a patient, how are you? Yeah. You need to take time to listen to the answer. It's it's not only a, a way to say hello. Uh, you really need to, to say this. Uh, you know, when I see younger residents, as people can see, I'm not anymore a young physician. Um, they, they are all very good on, on diabetes management in terms of technique. They, they are really well trained. But having known how are you and taking time to listen and also understanding that judgment have never helped anyone uh, in any case, far beyond eating disorders. So rather than to say this is not working, it's why is this not working <laughs> should be is usually a better way to, to address this. So uh, the way we approach those consultation is important, but I must say that a lot of my endo colleagues find that I'm a very inefficient doctor because I take too much time with the patient. So yeah. uh, this, uh, that's my reputation in, in my field. Yeah, but Remy, indeed it should be at the beginning of each consultation, but truly we need time to create a strong relationship with our patient and it takes time, you know. Uh, it's really frequent in my consultation. I have one hour and a half per patient. I mean, <laughs> my consultations are very long and it's very frequent that at the very end of the consultation, you know, this sends them right up. It's, oh, about sure. that doctor, you know, <laughs> and here again. And that's the time patient need to feel secure enough. So let me try to jump on one question. I just say so in the chat, which is related to this. Should we screen for everyone for eating disorder? I will like I will slightly change the question. Should we wait everyone? If you look to Diabetes Canada or Visit Canada, weight and weight circumference are considered as vital signs, and a vital sign probably should be taken. So what how you see this should we screen for is there a good thing that we could screen and discover some on as underestimated cases or are we going by this way to create at the same time some problems and again i'm using a bit provocative vocabulary here yes oh sorry 
Yeah, well, um, for a long time, that's what my um, endo team used to used to do: uh, blood pressure uh, readings of uh, glucose levels and uh, weight. And uh, I used to um, starve myself for over a week before every appointment because I knew that I was going to be waited at my appointment. So I would say no. <laughs> because uh, it puts, it may put a lot of stress uh, on the shoulders uh, of the patient. And, uh, and that's something else I wanted to mention. Um, what strikes me in the case you described was how much courage it took for that person to be open with you, even though she was not able to talk about that at the very first encounter. But well, uh, you are in a, uh, an appointment about diabetes, not about mental health. And we are so used to have people in the diabetes world not really knowledgeable, neither uh, comfortable with addressing mental distress. That in in the setting of, I want to be a good patient. Uh, I want my diabetes care team to like me. So I will put the better face I can, especially on the first appointment. And living with, um, especially I guess with um, bulimia, uh, rather than perhaps uh, orthorexia or anorexia. Um, overeating is a, somehow the worst you can do when you live with type 1 diabetes. So it's very shameful because you know that you are hurting yourself very badly, even uh, if in that case uh, the, the person was able to make up for the glucose intake. But I mean, she lost her teeth, all of them. And one question I was wondering uh, while uh, listening to you, Remy, was did she come up with the diagnosis of bulimia by herself? Or did her dentist mention that? Because I get that perhaps the dentist may... That have seen a red flag there. So you gave me a good occasion to see something that, that wasn't that case, but that we see frequently. The dentists say that she lost her teeth because of type 1 diabetes. You can have gingivitis very severe sometimes in diabetes. So there is a tendency because the type 1, I mean, all the form of diabetes, we were speaking type 1 here, can potentially damage everything from the toes to the hair. Uh, there is an over tendency in the medical community to say, oh, this is about your diabetes. And, and, and roughly every half day, I intervene with a patient. I say, you know, at least based on my experience, I don't believe type 1 diabetes is there. You, you can have two diseases at the same time. Unfortunately, you, you can do this. So that's a, no, the dentist, I, I asked the question and the dentist did not raise anything. Uh, she said he took, she said she did a good rate, great work and took a lot of money for that. Uh, which doesn't mean the dentist was not good, but uh, she, 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 she's worried. She has a debt at the bank now. So it, it's, it's an important thing for her. I'm just going to unmute really quickly to say that Remy's also answered the question that we got around, should a check for eating disorders be a part of every visit? Partly he did that out loud, but he also added in the chat just for the recording for people who won't see the chat. He says, maybe ask for permission about measuring weight or speak about an eating disorder and at least to us in the eating disorder space, something that we've especially been thinking of recommending more and more when a semiglutide or ozempic is being part of a conversation is as part of that conversation about that medication, potentially that's a nice hint to say, let's screen for an eating disorder at that point. Um, and like that might be a potential means. Uh, yeah, uh, and why and why having, um, yeah, and why having, Semaglutide is so important for you right now. What's the urgence to uh, get this medication? And in terms of the question, I try to never wait 
my patient, you know, I have no skill in my office, but it's quite easy because part of the hospital, some other do it for me, but I mean, I, I try to avoid uh, any waiting. And, and moreover, I would say, I try to avoid any comment about weight or shape variation in my professional or personal life. Personal life. I mean, if you try to comment the weight of anyone around me, <laughs> it would be a quite hard time for you. Uh, and it's very important. But I, I'm very welcoming uh, any comment from the patient about his weight, his or her weight variation. I mean, if it's if it's a concern for the patient, it's a concern for me. If it's not a concern for the patient, I don't want to address such a subject. Uh, but I'm a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> this may be easier for me than for the endocrinologist, but um, just, I mean, just think, is it really a need this day to wait my patient or to speak about weight variation right now? Uh, do I really need that for my medical, uh, on medical purpose? I mean, uh, and regarding the screening of eating disorder, I mean, yes, <laughs> should be part of every initial clinical assessment, I, I will say. And um, uh Maybe not saying, are you suffering from anorexia nervosa? I mean, there is other way uh, to ask the question. And have you any concern regarding uh, your eating habit? Are you suffering from your relation uh, to food or to eating uh, habit? You know, this type of question are quite open and maybe uh, very successful uh, to offer a good opportunity for the patient. Maybe we can add that like prevalence of disordered eating behaviors or eating disorders are higher in, in type 1 diabetes yeah. than in the general population. So there is definitely a need um, or indication to to try to screen for that. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing I was going to add is just like we said before, yes, we often tend to say that it's more women, but we also see a, a good number of men uh, and potentially there's more, but they weren't screened for. So um, just to to stay aware. I'm going to read this comment from Lauren in the chat to see if the panel has thoughts on it. Um, Lauren notes, I see so many challenges for this person as they work on their recovery journey. Once they reduce slash stop purging, their glucose levels will likely be all over the place as the binging will likely still be present even if reduced and they will no longer be the perfect patient. This will likely cause or contribute to a lot of distress which could increase eating disorder behaviors. Any thoughts on that as a panel? Actually, that patient is now worried about gaining weight uh, because she said, yes, uh, I might be able to control better my, my bulimia but will I gain weight? And, and this referred to some of the comments she had in the past about the importance of not gaining weight from her pediatric follow-up, I guess, uh, plus the social pressure and so on all around. Yeah, and again, gaining weight is also really part of the diagnosis of uh, eating disorder. And this also answers to a question in the chat. Is it, in this case, an eating disorder or this is a specific eating disorder of type 1 uh, diabetes. And uh, I think that's challenging because, you know, um, the, the most validated tool for uh, treating to treat eating disorder is the cognitive behavioral therapy from Fairburn. And in this therapy, we will ask patients to eat every four hours. And, you know, this is very difficult uh, when you're suffering or living with a type 1 diabetes. I mean, this is, this. I, I'm just thinking that it's imply getting more uh, insulin compensation as how will I deal with my collation, which type of collation of food in the, and our current uh, program for eating disorder are not, uh, I think, adapt to uh, type one diabetes. Um, but at the contrary, focusing only on kind of specific, very different eating disorder may also you know, uh, may also be challenging uh, or maybe another, because we will miss all the trans-diagnostic aspects of eating disorder. So yes, we have really to build uh, some program and culture. Sylvain, it might be the time to speak about how diabetes technology might help some of those patients, either the one you presented or the one I presented, because 
this is a huge change in diabetes management over the last decade. We had all those continuous glucose monitoring devices, which are used by far more than 50% of the patient, approximately two-thirds in, 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 in Canada. The problem is that the numbers coming from Versus are not very coherent, but probably around two-thirds of the patient using it and more and more well reimbursed. But there is also those new pumps uh, that are able to speak to those sensors and adjust in part insulin. Uh, so from the endocrinologist's point of view, it is less hypo, it is less hyper, and some less burden. Uh, doesn't mean that the burden is not there anymore, but there, there is a reduction of burden, which remain quite high. What is the point of view of uh, maybe you, Sylvain, and Aude uh, around uh, what those diabetes technology can, can help, or can they relieve some parts, some of the eating disorders? <laughs> That's very difficult to answer. I mean, there is no one size fit all solution. Uh, uh, we have really to uh, have this discussion and uh, the same case for the first patient we talk about. I mean, uh, this type of system may be very helpful, I, I believe so, but we uh, we still need to explore that. I think and sophie is maybe the best <laughs> to answer this question because, you know, we are still in this, you are still in a lot, but uh, with Remy, uh, but truly it can help to decrease the cognitive load and the anxiety related to diabetes uh, life <laughs> or life with diabetes. But it also can be sometimes very, uh, I'm very anxious to just give the control to a tool. I mean, you know, it's kind of artificial intelligence based mechanism. We don't know what's occur inside this. We can take easily the control back. Uh, so it can also be frightening. And Some patients actually describe that with less glucose fluctuation, they have also less mood and less appetite or triggering their, their, their intention to eat uh, hunger, hunger or... Uh, um, how you say that feeling a full it, it, it is it is modified. I, I don't believe there is good literature on this, but I have heard this on a regular basis, and I believe and, and I, we we are starting yeah, to I'll... look at it. And and what we see is that um, people using those automated insulin device seems to have more dis dis inhibition towards what they are eating. Um, they are less restrictive as well. Um, so we do tend to see a shift in the relationship with food when we start technology. So I think it we need to work with, with the patient when they start this technology to make them comfortable with it. And as dietitian, I think we need also to adjust our recommendation that to be as focus on carb counting whenever we have someone that has a trouble relationship with, with their food um, and acknowledging that there's a range of carbs that are allowed. Um, and as long as there's no nutritional deficiencies, it's also okay to be on the lower end of carbohydrate. And we may also, uh, we may still be healthy with that. Um, oh, I know you wanted to add something. Yeah, um, it's just about the uh, adverse effects of uh, what otherwise are very useful technologies. And I get that a lot of us people living with type 1 diabetes we would never um, regret and we never go back to finger pricks and, and stuff like that. But it comes with uh, strings attached. And uh, uh, Jennifer in the chat uh, mentioned um, the, the case of some of the teams, uh, the teams that she's following, and I can only relate. Uh, thanks God that CGM did not exist when I was a teenager, because I knew I, I definitely know that my parents would have been over my uh, curves uh, all the time, and there are some experiences that I did as a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> that um, it, it's good that my parents were just unaware um, of that. Uh, there is also the issue of the body image. It's not easy, even for me at uh, 45 years old now, uh, to go to the gym wearing my um, CGM and my insulin pump 
for everyone to see because that can lead to inappropriate questions. And sometimes you just want to exercise and not give a lecture on type 1 diabetes and so forth and so on. So um, I think it's very important that um, the person have, has the choice to switch from one way or to, to another. I know that some people during the summertime, for instance, they decide to go back to multiple daily injections and finger pricks because they don't have they don't want to have their disease uh, uh, for everyone to see. And the second um the, the second thing that I wanted to underline, and I don't know whether that should have been for you, Remy, a trigger, it's the 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 step count. Because it's since now all the CGM data are available on your cell phone, usually it goes through the um, application of your own mobile device. And that uh, application will give you your blood glucose levels, but as well your cardiac rhythm, uh, the number of steps you are doing every day. And for certain types, uh, I guess the perfectionist types of uh, people, uh, well, you have a report at the end of the week saying, ah, you exercised less this week than last week, which is totally, I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you work, <laughs> you have a grant to write, and <laughs> you basically spend your week uh, uh, sitting on your chair. And of course, you don't do your uh, 1,000, uh, 10,000 steps uh, a day. And that can be uh, stressful. And for um, someone with type 1 diabetes, the fact to see your curves and have some change of colors when you go uh, above the target range, that can be uh, something stressful just because you feel like you are failing in diabetes. So uh, as, uh, as soon as it's beginning to be a concern or something that makes the person suffer, uh, that we need to foster a sound relationship with the technological means that we live with. They can do a lot of good. They can be problematic as, for instance, in the online community, there are sometimes some kind of contest uh, between people about how flat my line has been during the day. But that's completely unphysiological. There is no no one not living with type 1 diabetes that would achieve such a flight line in a day. So there are a lot of self-experiments, and that's totally fine. But sometimes um, the access to this data can lead to completely unrealistic goals. And of sure. course, what happens with these kind of goals is that you fail and you feel like a failure. And that's a, that's a problem. So that's a very good point to remind that even a non-person living without diabetes will never have 100% time in range. The problem is going to be, I mean, uh, NEDIC is going to have a lot of work because those sensors now are available, at least in the U.S. for the general population. They are people. There is actually a French-American uh, girl who have more than 5 million followers on Instagram which is preaching for a flat curve. So we are going to create a, a, a lot of issues. There was another issue mentioned uh, actually is access and reimbursement and cost. It can be extremely costly when it's not covered. So you're absolutely right because we are close to running off time. I see Jennifer actually uh, has raised her hand. Yeah, you're still muted, Jennifer. Not enough experience through okay. the COVID, <laughs> Can you hear me now? The COVID period. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we are. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Ode, and uh, for describing some of what you experienced. I, I work in both the pediatric uh, obesity clinic and the diabetes clinic, and I sometimes struggle to 
figure out the treatment approach uh, that speaks to developing a healthy relationship with food and eating. Um, normally, I would go with developing a sense of your own cues, developing a healthy, uh, positive relationship with eating. Uh, and we often, if it was just the eating disorder, would try to avoid the calorie counting. And like you said, the focus on the details and controlling everything. I'm just wondering if the panel has any tips on how to blend like what we know about how to typically develop a healthy relationship with food and our bodies um, while balancing this need to control and uh, monitor everything. I, I find it uh, a unique challenge. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge that the uh, recommendations for good clinical practice for nutrition are based on nearly nothing for type 1 diabetes. We don't have so much literature. So, you know, the basement, the, the foundation is not very strong. And if we believe that patients are their own best experts, I don't see why a patient without major psychiatric issues would do bad thing for his or her health. And most of the time, we all know that this can happen. Uh, we observe through the better registry, for example, we have data now close to 5,000 people with Anne-Sophie, Sylvain, and all the way for the four of us working on this, that the patient with type 1 tend to eat far less carbohydrate than is usually recommended. Uh, and there is probably here a yin and a potential yang. Uh, the yin is that they see that their glucose is improving immediately. Uh, and uh, we see this in the registry. We clearly see that the people, not I'm not speaking of people making keto diet, but people tending to restrict their carbohydrate compared to the usual recommendation tend to have a far better glucose control. If I remember well, and Sophie, it's doubling the likelihood to reach the A1C target if the target, it's an essential target, but it might not be. At the opposite, we need to acknowledge that we don't know if this would increase the risk of cardiovascular disease on the long term, for example, you know, you could raise, raise your LDL or have a worse quality lipid profile that might be deleterious or have some liver issues with this. There is no signal at this point, but I need we need to be uh, cautious ar around this. So sorry my, for my too long answer for the, at, at that time. I believe we don't know a lot about nutrition in type, uh, overall and specifically in type 1. And if I may, um, it all depends, of course, of the person. But for some communities, there are uh, a lot of affectivity and emotions, positive and perhaps negative, surrounding food. So perhaps a good approach is to uh, identify with the person what are the important meals of or the period for those who are Muslim, for instance, to what extent it's important or because of uh, ethnic background. Uh, I, I know that a, a, a friend of mine, she's Indian and there is no meal without rice because that's the basis of that. Uh, and so perhaps, uh, and I would say it's the same with physical activity. Uh, you can, uh, exercise for fun or because you want to improve your health or to become an athlete and so forth. But for most of us, it's just for having fun, uh, the, the fun to move around and for uh, eating. Uh, eating is sometimes um, invested uh, with meanings and values that are completely uh, irrational and uh, invested with very health uh, a lot of health beliefs and stuff like that. Um, I would suggest that, uh, okay, what, what do you like to eat? Do you like to cook? Uh, what kind of food are you comfortable with eating? And what are the foods that you would like to eat, but you restrain from eating because, and it's not a, a, a all or nothing uh, approach. You can sometimes make it up for a donut or what have you. Sylvain, can you switch to the next slide so we just wrap up, please? Uh, and I'm the culprit of being a bit late. Uh, so for me, uh, that patient had bulimia. I, I saw some people challenging this in, in the chat, and it's perfectly normal. I don't believe there is not a blood glucose. It's not diabetes. Psychiatric disorders is not like diabetes. You cannot diagnose this, this with a, a blood thing. So we went really for crown 
reassurance. We changed the follow-up pattern for her. Uh, we had a quick referral. And I, I must mention that in some cases, outside of Health Canada indication, with no endorsement, neither by NIDIC, which I did not discuss with them, but I am quite sure by this, and GDRF, there are some people tremendously held by Ozempic outside of the classical indication. In those cases, we, we need to better refine who is getting this or not getting this. And my point here as an endocrinologist is this should be done with the mental health team hand in hand here. There are some patients really benefiting from these drugs beyond what Elon Musk, Opfra, and so on people told about that drug, not to lose a few kilograms before you take your bath suit to the south. Thank you. I think we will conclude on those words. Don't uh -huh. take for granted what uh, Elon Musk says. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder, uh, Sylvain, if you want to turn to just resources slide for people to know that it's there and we can maybe wrap up there. Yes, it's the next And they step. were they were listed, I think, in the chat at the beginning, or were yeah, they? they I think they were. Uh, and so sorry for those, we, we did not answer to all the comments in the chat. I tried to follow them, but I lost some. Sorry, I, I apologize for this. And please feel free to uh, full file the forms in order to get any comments uh, to improve the future webinar. Yeah, Amanda's put a comment in the, um, into the chat with our yeah. anonymous feedback form. If you have a few minutes to take that um, and fill that out, it'll help us if you want us to continue the conversation. This part two discussion came out of people filling out that feedback form to part one that we had in December last year. Um, if you feel like you know people in your life who are um, impacted by eating disorders in English, they can reach out to Netic. In French, they can reach out to Enab Quebec. Um, and as you all know very well, um, JDRF Canada has both um, information for healthcare providers as well as some specific information around mental health and type 1 diabetes. And we'll make sure to send these resources out to you as part of our post webinar follow up email. You'll get an email in about a week's time with the link to the recording as well. Um, you'll also get some access to some of these resources too, but fill out that feedback form if you feel like there's more that you would like in this topic. Um, Remy, Aude, oh, and Sophie, Sylvain, merci. Anything else you want to say um, before we wrap up? I love merci. your t-shirt, Ari. Good enough. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much for the support indeed. Bye-bye. Thanks, Remy. Bye.